Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I am the guy who picked Bernardo Sopai to defeat Vinicius de Oliveira. And I'm here to talk about UFC 299's main card, which is stellar. And frankly, so are the televised prelims. There are 14 fights altogether on this card, and I think there's eight of them that could headline a fight night event right now. This card is amazing. Doesn't quite hit UFC 300 levels, which is still a disappointment in its own way because uh, special fights weren't booked, I guess. But that card's a 10 out of 10. This card right here is a 9.5 out of 10, UFC 299. And I'm really pumped for it because don't forget, UFC 199 was better than UFC 200. Although UFC 100 was better than 99. So whatever. Anyway. I am going to start with the only fight on the card, despite it being stacked, that is worthy of headlining a pay-per-view, and that is Sean O'Malley defending the bantamweight title against Cheeto Vera in a rematch. Sean O'Malley has lost once as a professional, and although, if you ask him, he hasn't lost, uh, but Cheeto Vera is the guy to get it done. Cheeto Vera got him out of there with elbows on the ground. No doubt about it, the leg kicks were the story of the loss because he gave uh, Sean O'Malley drop foot. I don't even know what the fuck that is. I've heard it thrown around by some people, Henry Cejudo and whatever. Whatever happened with his ankle or his foot and whatever happened in the Sukumtak fight, it definitely led to the uh, finish eventually. And Sean O'Malley was compromised on that leg for a minute or so before he hit the ground. Uh, but once he did hit the ground, what happened was he was knocked half out. It wasn't like, ah, oh, his leg gave out and he couldn't get up or whatever. Some Kenny Florian Dean Thomas type of situation. No, this was him getting half knocked out. I think a lot of people would describe it as a flash knockout where he went limp for a flash or whatever. But it was enough to be a legitimate finish on its own, just the elbows. So... There's something there, is my point. Uh, but Cheeto Vera definitely got the ball rolling with leg kicks. And that's the thing with this fight. Cheeto Vera is always going to be dangerous. Always. And he's got five rounds to be dangerous. Um, most fighters aren't guaranteed that because they have fragilities, weaknesses in one area or another. Cheeto Vera doesn't. Not that, I mean, he's got weaknesses, but he's almost impossible to finish. He's the toughest guy in the UFC, aside from maybe Pedro Munoz, who's also fighting on this card, and beat him, by the way, in my opinion. But that was a really razor-thin fight. Could have gone either way. Uh, but, look, my prediction for this fight, which I should have given it to you at the top of the video instead of three minutes in, I'm going with Cheeto Vera. But my prediction is he gets his ass kicked every second of the fight until he gets the finish. Kind of like the first fight. I thought Sean O'Malley was cruising, and I think Sean O'Malley will be cruising here. And I do think Sean O'Malley knows, I'm sure his camp has prepared him to protect his legs. Not that that's the only danger with Cheeto Vera. Cheeto Vera will kick your fucking head off any which way. Front kick, wide head kick, uh, whatever. He gets it done. And on the ground... Cheeto Vera is also a very good submission artist, although he's a better submission artist than he is an overall grappler and certainly wrestler. Although he's not dog shit there. He's a well-rounded guy, just he's not the type of guy to impose his grappling on someone regularly. He's done it in the past. I just watched uh, pretty much his whole UFC career. He's done it at the UFC level. But it's not something you can rely upon. And Sean O'Malley is a very good anti-grappler. I mean, he was in there for seven minutes with Aljamain Sterling, tied up with him pretty closely for a good chunk of it, or a small chunk of it, and uh, in the end kept himself up and got the knockout. Uh, but, again, this fight is going one way or the other. O'Malley by decision or Cheeto Vera via finish. For Cheeto Vera to get a decision, he would have to hurt you five times, or three times, I guess, and win uh, at least three rounds. But he's done it before. Look at his fight against Rob Font. He was losing every small moment of the fight, but he had five big moments, one in each round, and he, it was a shutout in the end on the uh, scorecards. So 
Uh, it's going to go one way or the other, and I think that makes me uh, more comfortable to bet on it. I love Cheeto Vera's money line, as is, at plus 230, but this is a fight where I want to see the props because I can almost guarantee if O'Malley wins, it goes to a decision. Nobody's ever finished Cheeto Vera. Sean O'Malley, of course, uh, could get it done with a knockout, but a submission is not on the table, in my opinion. And for Cheeto Vera... I'd be surprised if he submitted O'Malley, although I've seen O'Malley get tapped uh, twice as an amateur 10 years ago and by uh, Hector Lombard a few years ago in, in grappling. And I am aware that it's his biggest weakness compared to his striking. But I still think the finish is more likely to come through a TKO uh, in this fight if it was for a Cheeto Vera winning or O'Malley winning. Either way, it's going to be a TKO more likely. But... uh. I think Cheeto Vera, if he does win, it would be a finish. Again, him getting his ass kicked and turning the fight around on a dime and capitalizing on a moment. And that's what I'm predicting to happen. It's happened plenty of times. Dominic Cruz in round four. Brad Pickett way back when in round three. He was being shut out. Brad Pickett was cruising. This was his retirement fight. Cheeto Vera put an end to that. The Frankie Edgar fight was close. Uh, but... Uh, put an end to that with the front kick. He's a, a very dangerous guy and the durability plus the cardio and everything else makes him a five round threat. And I'm just thinking Sean O'Malley's going to have a moment uh, in between cruising where uh, Marlon Vera is going to turn the fight around. So that's the prediction. Marlon Vera by finish TKO middle of the fight call it round three. Uh, it's happened a few times in round three. I guess I'll go with round three again. But really, any round wouldn't uh, surprise me. Of course, in the first fight, it happened in one round. Uh, but I think uh, Sean O'Malley looks good until it's over. As for the bets, I love Cheeto Vera's money line. I, I shouldn't say I love it because I could see O'Malley winning. But that's definitely the only value here, and it is my prediction. So I have played it. Uh, but I will wait to see the props because, again, if O'Malley wins, it's by decision. If Cheeto Vera wins, it's much more likely to be by finish uh, than a decision. Although O'Malley's tough as all fuck. And uh, he did beat Piotr Jan by decision, even though 30-27 Jan upon rewatch. Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is a big video. I'm doing a bunch of them. So continue watching. The next fight's coming up right now. All right, in, in like a second. Next up is the co-main event. Five rounds between Dustin Poirier and Benoit Santini. First, let me take a second to say that I love this. I love how they made this a super co-main event by making it five rounds. I don't think it's something they should do for every pay-per-view. But here and there, it does make uh, whatever fight it is very extra special. And that's how I look at this one. And I would have been pumped for this fight even if it was three rounds, just because it's one of the top guys of the old guard, Poirier, Gaethje, Chandler, taking on one of these newcomers who has a bunch of wins already inside the UFC, has everyone's attention and respect. That's what I mean by a newcomer. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But still, this is uh, similar to like Gaethje versus Rafael Fazeev from last year. Very cool matchup for Dustin Poirier. And I say that as a fan who acknowledges that he's only got a few fights left. And he could probably be sitting back looking to fight Conor McGregor or Nate Diaz. And instead, he's stepping up here and giving us an awesome co-main event. So I'm rooting for him, to be honest. I'm rooting for Dustin Poirier. Uh, I tend to root for the veterans. But with my veteran bias and everything else included, I still have to say I'm picking against him here. I'm picking Benoit Santini. I'm picking him, but at minus 230, I am not betting on him to win this fight. I think uh, this could go wrong for him. And of course, I'm coming off being that dumbass who picked Shamil Gaziv to beat Jairzinho Rosenstrike. And I do think that's how this fight would look if things go wrong for Benoit Santini. He's already proven he can take a beating in his one loss, uh, which I'll get to in a second. And I do think uh, Dustin Poirier is so used to fighting every which way all over the place at a very high level where he just won't fatigue and maybe he can find a way to uh, 
take Benoit Anthony off his game and then keep him at the end of his strikes with an awesome jab, uh, like uh, Jair Zinia Rosenstruck did against Shamil Gazeev. But I do think Benoit Santini should win this fight because he has a lot more upside and Dustin Poirier is now on the wrong side of 35. And of course he's coming off his third knockout loss. These losses are spread out a little bit, but it's three knockout losses, three definite concussions. This one was six months ago, whatever. And again, he's only older and Benoit Santini is a fucking killer. Benoit Santini is a grappler first and foremost. And I do think he could take advantage of Dustin. He's a bigger guy, and he's got a monstrous top game. I do think if he's on top of Dustin, as good as Dustin is, Dustin's still in trouble. But I would still say the more likely finish for Santini would be on the feet. Santini, while he's only got a few TKOs, he's definitely a monster. Uh, He's got vicious kicks specifically, but also punches. I mean, the guy hits like a fucking truck. And he's also uh, tough. Tough as all fuck. He can take what's coming back from him from Poirier. I do think Poirier is the better technician, certainly with his hands. I think if Poirier gets going with his hands, he is winning that fight. But Benoit Santini hits harder. I think he's a little stronger. And again, I trust everything about him health-wise. Whereas there's only doubts and. it. Uh, the only bigger doubts as Dustin Poirier gets older and gets finished more. As for, as for the submission, Poirier's only been submitted by the best Khabib, Charles Oliveira, prime Korean zombie, you know, uh, it, uh, it would take somebody special to get him out of there. I do think Benoit Santini could get it done, but it still would kind of surprise me. I would say a knockout is more likely, even though Santini doesn't have even close to half the knockouts that he does submissions. He's just uh, up against the guy in Dustin Poirier where I think the weaknesses would tell the tale. And as for winning a decision for Benoit Santini, I'd be most surprised by that. I'd be most surprised if he won a decision uh, just because Poirier, he's only lost two decisions and they were very early in his career to Cub Swanson and Danny Castillo in the WEC. Uh, So, I think uh, Benoit with his offense, the fact that he never has won a decision, he's got uh, 13 wins, all 13 by finish, four by knockout, nine by submission. The guy gets it done, and he gets it done deep into the fight as well. Uh, I believe that's where most, if not all, of his knockouts come in round two. Not that that's deep into the fight, but uh, it's not round one. And while I can't trust him in five rounds against Dustin Poirier, I, you know, I don't it's not something you can rely upon. It's not something you can doubt either. He's passed every test uh, again. And he's fought some good fighters before he got to the UFC, Benoit Santini. He didn't have an easy road, fought a lot of good fighters and looked good in every one of his fights. Uh, so, and finished them all as well. Aside from the guy, Powell Kielik, which was a no contest, but he looked really good in that fight anyway. And that was a competitive test. So, I'm picking Benoit Santini. I think uh, Dustin Poirier's got a lot going against him, and uh, Benoit Santini's got a lot going for him. As for the bet, I haven't bet on this. Uh, he's, he's minus 230. Poirier's plus 185, which is kind of intriguing, to be honest, but I'm not going to bet on him at all. I'm just going to sit back and root for him. Let's go Diamond, Dustin Poirier. Although, uh, Benoit Santini, nothing against him. I love watching that guy fight, and... Wouldn't care at all if he uh, continued to uh, rise. Next up, we have, yeah, you're right. I changed my shirt. It's fucking hot in here. And I don't want to put on the air conditioning or the fan because it makes noise. Whatever. So I am the guy in my undershirt here to talk about Kevin Holland versus Michael Venom Page. Michael Venom Page is a star. He's a star from Bellator. That is why he is in the third fight from the top on a big UFC pay-per-view here. This is a very high-profile fight. I'm sure you know Michael Venom Page, but on the off chance you don't, just trust me, he is absolutely absolutely right where he belongs on the, uh, on the card. But Kevin Holland is too. Kevin Holland is a fan favorite, one of the more appreciated fighters. Uh, I feel like 
He is uh, a fan favorite, you know, people's fighter because he shows up, he's always ready, and he's got that cowboy aura about him. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But moving on. My pick for this fight is Michael Venom Page. That's right. After all that cowboy shit, I'm going with Michael Venom Page. I think he's going to win this fight because I don't trust Kevin Holland to make the most of his skill set. Specifically, I don't trust Kevin Holland to make the most of his grappling, which I know he's never been the wrestling beast, which you need to uh, get the grappling going most of the time. But uh, just in general, he's a guy who has obliged his opponents and uh, fallen into traps, I felt like, getting comfortable in fights in which he shouldn't be comfortable. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, and even against Jack Della Maddalena. Well, I think that was a split decision. Uh, he definitely lost the fight, and I felt like he didn't fight the hardest for my money as a guy who bet on him. He just, he didn't. Uh, that Max Adesical shit, and also, not that he's done this so much recently, but the talking in between fights and whatever, I don't know. Uh, just a, I'm picking Michael Venom Page plainly because despite him being a limited fighter, and not having the wrestling specifically, which is the primary weakness of Kevin Holland, and despite him only having one path to victory, really, one area of victory over Kevin Holland, I think Kevin Holland will fight his fight. And I think Michael Venom Page can duplicate the success of Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. That's right. I was stupid enough to rewatch that fight. Uh, look, that's a fight you have to rewatch. It's the most similar matchup, but I'm aware Kevin Holland and Wonderboy were friends and they cut a deal and whatever, and it looked like Kevin Holland was honoring that uh, deal, even though he ripped them to the mat once or whatever. But in general, Kevin Holland uh, is not the guy to uh, take the fight to the ground. He wants the knockout first, despite him being really good and really slick on the ground, and especially off his back. Uh, but here against Michael Venom Page, Michael Venom Page is like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. I think he wins the point fighting battle and he throws him off with his unique style. But also Michael Venom Page has concussive power and real danger that Wonderboy does not have, not consistently anyway. You know, maybe against uh, Jake Ellenberger. But uh, Michael Venom Page is a guy that has caved someone's head in, Cyborg's husband. And he's uh, just... A little physically stronger, too. I think despite he and Kevin Holland being pretty much the same size and having the same frame, uh, Michael Venom Page is going to be a little stronger, and that should help him in the little in-between moments, if they are the, uh, those little in-between moments where Kevin Holland is grappling or thinking about it anyway. So I think Kevin Holland gets caught fighting Michael Venom Page's fight and trying to land a big bomb, which I should mention, Michael Venom Page has been knocked out by Douglas Lima. Lima kicked his leg out and then hit him with a beautiful uppercut. One of the best knockouts I've ever seen. That did happen. It was probably five years ago or so. And since then, uh, MVP has avenged that loss by decision. But that's how he was finished. And that could happen with Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland, I've always said, has deceptively good power for somebody who's uh, long, tall, and skinny and lanky. He's got really good pop in his punches. And he's got good long punches as well. These guys are the same height, but I believe Kevin Holland has two inches of reach over Michael Venom Page. I really hope it's not the opposite way, which it might be. But I think Kevin Holland has 81 versus 79. Uh, and Kevin Holland, one thing I'll give him, I trust his durability a lot more. He's been finished by submission mainly, by some really good submission artists, Rafael Lovato Jr., Brendan Allen, whoever the fuck else. Uh, but... Kyle Doggins doesn't count. But that is not a path to victory here against Michael Venom Page. And as far as his durability, his chin, Kevin Holland has a very good chin. And I'd be very surprised if even Michael Venom Page knocked him out. Not very surprised, but partially surprised. Because MVP is very fucking dangerous. So... I'm rooting for Kevin Holland, but not so much because I did bet on Michael Venom Page at plus 115. And I'll wait to see the props because uh, I do think MVP, if he does win this fight, it's much more likely to be by decision than by finish. Just because I trust the durability of Kevin Holland, especially in a three-round fight. But Kevin Holland, 
If he mixes shit up, he'll make me happy. Even though I'll lose a little bit of money, I'll be happy seeing Kevin Holland get a big victory like this and doing so the way I'd like to see him to do so. Yeah, it'd be cool if he knocked out Michael Venom Page. But, you know, it's even cooler being that high-level UFC guy who can next level a fighter the caliber of Michael Venom Page and doing it with grappling, something uh, you consider secondary in your skill set. So hoping for Kevin Holland, always been a fan of his. And uh, uh, if I'm wrong, hey, at least I won some money on Michael Venom Page. And I almost did the like, share, subscribe horseshit, but instead stick around and listen to me break down uh, who is it next. I don't know. Burns and Della Maddalena. All right. right. Turns out I was right. Gilbert Burns is fighting Jack Della Maddalena next. And my pick for this fight is Gilbert Burns. I've got him winning this fight, but my heart isn't totally into it because he is 37 years old. He's got a lot of mileage on him and knockout losses, a few of them anyway. And, of course, he looked like shit in his last fight against Bilal Muhammad. He said he was injured, and you know what, I believe him, but still, uh, through whatever means and for whatever reason, he looked like shit. Uh, but despite that, I'm still picking him to win because I think he might have a grappling advantage here. He definitely has the better grappling, incredible jujitsu, Gilbert Burns, and I believe he's got the athleticism and wrestling to uh, take this fight into his world. Uh, but again, Jack Della Maddalena is dangerous and with the doubt I have against Gilbert Burns and his overall health as a fighter, uh, fighting the best fighters in the world, I wouldn't be surprised if Jack was able to get him out of there. Jack is a ferocious striker. Uh, he's a, a stalker and a patient killer, but patience only helps with takedown defense. He's not going to be rushing in and get uh, hit with a counter double, although that still might happen. Uh, but uh, despite him being precisely the kind of striker that I think would get Gilbert Burns out of there, I still pick Gilbert Burns to win because I think Gilbert Burns will be able to get him to the mat. Only a few fighters have gotten him to the mat since he's been in the UFC or at the UFC level. Uh, that's Angelusa. That's why I said UFC level because that fight took place in the Contender Series. But Angelusa was able to get him down, or Angelosa. Uh, then... Ramazan Amiv got him down very briefly, and he was finished within two minutes in that fight anyway, but he still got him down and put him in a tight choke. And Basil Hafez, that's the guy that really had a lot of success against Jack Della Maddalena, and he did so under shitty circumstances. But he's the guy who came in under shitty circumstances and said, I have to outgrapple this guy. I have to get this guy to the ground. And he did so repeatedly and had a lot of success and in the end, that was a really, really close fight. Uh, but Gilbert Burns, he's, uh, despite having maybe lost a step in whatever, he's still a guy who in the last few years has out-wrestled and out-grappled, of course, uh, Jorge Masvidal and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. And, of course, you can make excuses for them and say they fell off a cliff and they're past their primes and whatever. <laughs> No cough button, button here. You just have to fucking sit through that. <coughs> and then I'll get all dramatic with it like I usually do. You have to see me sneeze. I get fucking dramatic. But anyway, I think Gilbert Burns still has the athleticism and the wrestling to complement his jujitsu. And I think Gilbert Burns will, and of course the striking as well. Gilbert Burns is not the striker of Jack Della Maddalena, but he's very comfortable on his feet. And I'd say between the two of them, he's still got the bigger missile, the bigger overhand. And I think uh, that could keep him safe at moments. And of course, what do I know? Could knock out Jack. But I think uh, it's only going to serve to help him get the fight to the ground if he knows what he's doing. And uh, Gilbert Burns, once he's on the ground, he's going to have control. I mean, if, even if he's not able to go cut right through Jack's guard and put him away with the submission, Jack is not going to be able to escape if Gilbert Burns is on top of him. Once he's got you down, just the jujitsu, he he will hold you down. Every which way, you're not going to be able to move. Uh, not Certainly not able to dictate things. So I think he's only got to get him down really twice, but, uh, you know, uh, he's got to survive the other five minutes. 
but he's going to have to get a few takedowns here, and I'm trusting Gilbert Burns to do it. I think Jack's also going to be not him, his full self offensively because he's going to see the athletic threat coming at him and Gilbert Burns and knowing the monster, monstrous ground game that he has there. So I'm expecting Jack to be a little more patient, which again will help with his takedown defense, but will hurt his offense on the flip side. And I'm thinking Gilbert Burns does shoot in on those hips. With Gilbert Burns, it's not going to be him striking his way into the clinch and hitting a trip takedown. Although that's totally going to happen now that I said that shit. But uh, Gilbert Burns has a really strong shot, very fast and in tight, despite being the smaller guy and whatever. He's still a fucking physical beast. And I think he's going to be able to win this fight. Uh, he sat plus 136, and I'm not going to lie, I've bet on him, but it's not something I'm uh, hanging my parlays on or anything. I uh, I will wait to see props, of course, because nothing's available, not even the over-under for this fight. Uh, but I do think Gilbert Burns takes Jack Della Maddalena down and uh, wins a longer fight. If it's totally going his way, a submission deeper into the fight wouldn't surprise me, but a decision is what I'd have in my head. Him doing a little bit better than the job Basil Hafez did and outpointing Jack. Of course, if I'm wrong, Jack Della Maddalena could be the third guy to knock him out after Kamaru Usman and uh, Dan Hooker. And I think that's it. Uh, but uh, that, uh, other than that, uh, Jack Della Maddalena winning a decision wouldn't surprise me as far as his paths to victory go. Because uh, Gilbert Burns is very tough. Those are the only two guys who got him out of there. And uh, Gilbert Burns, despite being older and slower and whatever, the wheels haven't come off yet. And he's still got a pretty good, healthy profile as far as I'm concerned. But again, I'm going with Gilbert Burns. I think Gilbert Burns is able to uh, take this fight to the ground and uh, take away uh, the offense and the danger of Jack Della Maddalena and outpoint him. On to the next one. And the final fight of this video. But the opening fight on the main card of the pay-per-view is Song Yadong versus Pyotr Jan. I've gone back and forth on this fight, picking this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. And I ended up settling on this guy, Pyotr Jan. That's my prediction. He wins a decision, I guess. But my heart is not totally into it, uh, in case you didn't pick up on that. And I haven't bet on this fight. Not yet. I have to consume some alcohol first. But I'm picking him to win because I think he's uh, still he's underrated at this point. I think his skid, which I'll get to in a second, is um, very misleading. I think there's only one distinct loss, and that's his last loss against Marab Dwalish Willie. I do think he did not look good in that fight, but I do think that's the only guy who could not make him look good. I think Song Yitong is a big threat to Jan in this fight because, A, he's got the hardest punch maybe in the division, and I'd say he's certainly got the power advantage here as far as overhand power goes. And also, this is a three-round fight instead of a five-round fight, which only uh, exacerbates the power's uh, role in this fight. I think uh, Song Yidong, in a three-round fight, has a much better chance of winning a decision against Piotr Jan than he would in a five-round fight. Because Piotr Jan is a guy who, as pretentious cocksuckers like me like to say, makes reads. He makes reads. And he does make reads. That is a thing. But it's not a thing in this fight. If you're making reads, you threw away 33.3% of the fight. No making reads. Your foot has to be on the gas from the opening bell here. Uh, and I do think uh, that's going to be the case here. I don't think uh, Piotr Jan's going to be sitting back making too many raid, uh, reads. I think it's going to be slow pressure, him keeping himself safe on the feet. And hopefully, what I imagine when I say he wins a decision is he mixes in the wrestling. Piotr Jan is an excellent grappler, and he's got an underrated shot, very fast. And I think he's going to catch Song Yadong getting caught in a stand-up fight and uh, mix it up and outpoint him. That's my prediction. But Song Yidong is a monster. Song Yidong is a guy who you can't take chances with. And Pyotr Jan is a guy who relies too much on his defense. He will do that thing where he shells up and just waits for the onslaught to be over with. You can't do that with Song. Because Song, 
he tracks you through the guard, he can probably put you away. And if you leave your body open, shelling up, I'm sure Song Yidong is planning on this. If Yan does that thing where he shells up and Song is ripping the body, this is going to be Song's fight. So Piotr Yan can't let himself get hit like he has in the past. And he's got to be in and out or throwing back. Because uh, Piotr Yan is a very good striker himself. I do think he's given up a power advantage, but I still think his overall striking is beastly. And I think that's going to shine as well in this fight. I think Piotr Jan mixes shit up very well. He seems like he'd be bread and butter basics. And he's got a good one-two or whatever, but he mixes it up. He's got diverse kicking attacks, switch kicks, front kicks, body kicks, whatever. And again, a really good grappling game that I just think is underrated at this point. And also, I have to put his losses in context. He's on a four-fight skid. The loss against Marab is the one loss where you cannot dispute it. But every other loss, you can make excuses for. Aljamain Sterling, the disqualification, certainly. Jan was on his way to a victory. The rematch was close, although I thought Aljo won uh, 48-46. And Sean O'Malley who beat him uh, by split decision. I am the guy who picked Sean O'Malley to win by decision. But uh, even I'll admit, I got that one wrong. I thought Yam won that fight, and I rewatched it, and it was an awesome fucking fight, and O'Malley gave him hell. But I still thought Yam clearly won the fight. Whatever, this is all bitching for nothing. But I'll just say, uh, Yam is definitely underrated, because only one of his losses is indisputable. And uh, even his first loss on the regional scene, the Magomed Magomedov, that was his fight, in my opinion. So, and he avenged it anyway, but whatever. But Song Yidong, uh, I think this could prove to be a favorable matchup of all the top matchups for him because Pyotr Jan could give him that uh, boxing bout he's looking for where he allows his power to shine, uh, Song's power to shine. But I'm still picking Pyotr Jan to remind everybody how good he is to take Song Yidong out of his game, mix up some well-timed takedowns like Kyler Phillips did against Song Yidong. And also on the feet, uh, Piotr Jan, while he's not going to have five rounds to get going and take over a fight, he's, uh, I think he's technically superior to Song. And I think if he doesn't, if the power isn't the story of the fight, Jan is winning the stand-up battle as well. So, Piotr Jan by decision is the pick, and the bet is non-existent, because I'm not fucking stupid. Good luck with yours. Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit, and check out my other videos, where I'm going to cover. I'm doing one for the uh, ESPN prelims and then the early prelims.